boys. This is my church. And it wasn't my fault what happened to Joey. Down here, it's every man for himself. What do you really care, am I right? Doesn't everybody care about everybody else? And it wasn't my fault what happened to Joey. My brother. You should have looked out for me a little bit. It was you, Charlie. Thanks for watching my review and analysis of director Eli Kazan's 1954 American crime drama On the Waterfront, written by Bud Schulberg and produced by Sam Spiegel. On the Waterfront was inspired by a series of articles by Malcolm Johnson called Crime on the Waterfront, which were published in the New York Sun in 1948. On the Waterfront stars Marlon Brando I could have been somebody as Terry Malone. Call Malden. That's a crucifixion. As Father Barry. Lee J. Cobb as Johnny Friendly. Rod Steiger as Charlie the Gent. Eva Marie Saint as Edie Doyle. And Pat Henning as Timothy J. K.O. Dugan. However, before I get started, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to The Godfather of Cinema. Movie reviews and more give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment, and hit the bell so that you won't miss any new videos that I'll upload in the future. Pigeons have it made. All they have to do is eat and sleep all day and do nothing, like Terry Malloy. Once an up-and-coming boxer on the fast track until he throws a big fight that cost him a shot at the title. Charlie the Gent, Terry's older brother, and Johnny Friendly. Yeah, man. His boss make a lot of money from that fight, but all Terry gets is a one-way ticket to a soft job on a dock in Hoboken, New Jersey. In other words, Palookaville. Nobody bothers Terry as long as he respects the D and D, or deaf and dumb code of the neighborhood. Pigeons that keep their mouths shut are cared for and don't have to lift a finger like Terry, who has a comfortable loft on the dock, and nobody, not even the truth, is going to mess it up. Also, speaking of pigeons having it made, there's Father Barry, who, like Terry, has it made as long as he stays in the church, minds his own business, and stays out of Johnny Friendly's business. As long as he does these three things, Father Barry is somewhat respected and left alone. For instance, there is the scene on the dock in which one of Johnny's goons accidentally shoves Father Barry and quickly apologizes to him for doing so, and then there is the scene in which which Father Barry and the dock workers meet in the church. Johnny's goons get wind of this meeting and break up the meeting. Johnny's goons greet each of the dock workers with fists, feet, and baseball bats, but when Father Barry comes out of the church, Johnny's goons leave out of respect. But all of this respect for Father Barry's goals out the window when he decides to get personally involved with the dock workers and bringing Johnny Friendly to account following the death of dock worker K.O. Dugan. Someone knows the truth about who murdered Joey Doyle. But in order to get that truth out in the open means going against the neighborhood code of silence. In other words, the truth won't come to light about Joy's death without someone stepping forward and making a sacrifice. Joy Doyle made a sacrifice by agreeing to meet with the crime commission to testify against Johnny Friendly. Johnny and his goons insist that Joy's fall was an accident. However, the symbolism of his so-called accident was as plain as day. Joy raised pigeons on that rooftop and fell off of it because he wanted to open his mouth and talk. And the last person who saw Joy was the one who had asked him to meet him on that rooftop, Terry Malloy takes over Joey's pigeon coop and everything goes back to normal on the shipping docks, meaning every man for himself. Grown men literally fighting for work tokens like the pigeons in Terry's pigeon coop fighting over bird seed. But this does not sit well with an Irish dock worker named K.O. Dugan and Pops. Joey Doyle's father passes Joey's windbreaker and fighting spirit down to K.O. Dugan, who makes a disrespectful remark about Johnny Friendly within the earshot of a couple of Johnny's goons. They call him a big mouth, but K.O., like Joey Doyle, is outspoken and also plans to talk to the crime commission about Johnny Friendly and his involvement in Joey Doyle's death. One day, unloading a shipment of... Buy an Irish whiskey. K.O., 
who also happens to be Irish, is crushed when a pallet of that Irish whiskey accidentally falls on him as it is being lifted from the hold of the ship by a crane. Father Barry, who also happens to be on this ship, is a witness to K.O.'s death and knows that K.O.'s death was no accident as the common denominator with K.O. and Joey Doyle was that both men had intended to testify to the crime commission against Johnny Friendly. Father Barry delivers a fiery speech in the hold of the ship comparing K.O.'s death to a crucifixion and afterwards K.O.'s fighting spirit and dead body ascends to heaven with Father Barry standing over him as a crane lifts them both out of the ship symbolizing the truth coming out of darkness. Truth crusters will rise again. Into the light about both Joey Doyle's death and Charlie the Gent getting his brother Terry to throw a fight that would have made him a contender. It was you Charlie. However, in speaking out, one, against Johnny Friendly, and two, for the truth, Father Barry loses the man of the cloth immunity from Johnny Friendly that he once enjoyed. This scene marks a turning point for Father Barry, who now sees his role and that of the church as a platform for social activism as he and the church belong to the working men on the shipping dock. This is my church! He could no longer play it safe to get to the truth. He had to make a sacrifice. Now, with K.O. Dugan dead and Joy Doyle's windbreaker returned to Edie, his sister, she gives Joy Doyle's windbreaker and fighting spirit to Terry Malloy. For it is no coincidence that K.O., short for knockout, wore the windbreaker and that Terry, who now wears the jacket, happens to be an ex-boxer. <laughs> who had it made as long as he stayed in his cushy loft on the dock, turned a blind eye to evil and kept his mouth shut. But torn between his cushy loft down on the docks, the truth about Joy's murder and his love for Joy's sister Edie, Terry's conscience wins out and he agrees to talk to the crime commission about his boss. Opening his big mouth and breaking the DND code, Terry loses his soft job on the dock after Johnny bans him from getting any work. But worst of all, Terry loses the respect of his old gang. The Golden Warriors once idolized Terry. However, after he testifies in court against Johnny, they break the necks of every last one of his pigeons. Additionally, Terry also loses his brother, Charlie the Gent, who had sold him down the river for a bet when he could have been a contender. Charlie redeems himself and his brother with his life. And Terry, wearing the windbreaker of two fighters, Joey Doyle and K.O. Dugan, redeems himself by taking on Johnny friendly, getting his job back, beating the count, and winning. In the documentary on the DVD of On the Waterfront, actor Rod Steiger describes the four-minute taxicab scene between himself and Marlon Brando as a heavyweight match between two actors at the top of their craft, and I agree. There are a lot of things that make this scene work, one being that the director allowed Brando and Steiger to improvise most of their lines. Another thing that makes this scene really click is the way that Brando brings out the feminine side of his character according to James Lipton, host of Inside the Actor Studio. He is speaking of the point in which Charlie draws his gun on Terry who pushes the gun down gently as if you are observing an intimate moment between lovers. I would compare James Lipton's characterization of this moment between Charlie the Gent and Terry Malloy with the scene in which Terry recounts to Eve. Joy Doyle's sister, the way the nuns at their school used to abuse him. When he asked Edie how she would have handled him, her reply to him that she would have been patient and kind to him instead of beating him causes Terry to open up to her about the way that his brother Charlie sabotaged his boxing career and abused their relationship by persuading him to lose a match he could have won. 
The gritty look of On the Waterfront takes its cues from a style born out of post-World War II called neorealism that is characterized by scenes shot on location depicting everyday life such as the men working on the docks, the crowded bar scene, the slums, and the littered alleyways. Maul and Brando were subjected to very little makeup in this film and blends in with the real location seamlessly as does his co-star Eva Marie Saint in her film debut. Anyway, when it comes to the greatest film ever, this film, On the Waterfront, has to be in the same conversation as films like The Godfather, Vertigo, Network, and Citizen Kane. Personally, I think that On the Waterfront is the best film ever when you take the writing, acting, directing, and cinematography into account. On the same note, I believe that any list of the quote-unquote greatest directors that doesn't include Eli Kazan's name is not a list worth any serious consideration. Anyway, thanks once again for watching my review of director Eli Kazan's 1954 crime drama On the Waterfront and be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to The Godfather of Cinema and hit the bell for more reviews like this one. I will see you soon.